And I had no idea this guest was booked way before that Campion woman said the stupid thing at the Critics' Choice Awards, but it seems so apropos. And let me welcome to the show for the first time. She's the author of The Truth About White Lies. It's a YA book, so let's get them young. I know she's probably going to be on that banned book list soon. Let me welcome <laughs> Olivia A. Cole. Welcome to the Karen Hunter Show. Hey, thank you so much for having me, really. I'm really honored. I appreciate it. Oh, it listen, uh, when I saw this, I was like, yes, we have to talk. We have to talk. I think, you know, before you came on, I was like, the, the goal should be to find yourself in everybody, right? Find yourself mm -hmm. in people, which then draws you to them, right? Find the commonality, find the thing that makes us more similar, find the thing that you like. Um, but we don't seem to be there. There's, there's to me, a disconnect with a whole faction of society where it's us and them. And them, they're alien, foreign, they're not like us, which allows you to demonize and treat people poorly and uh, not see them. What was the impetus for writing The Truth About White Lies and walk us through that journey? Yeah, sure. I mean, really a lot of what you just said, that, that us and them mentality that, um, you know, I think white people are conditioned not to notice and to just kind of accept as the norm. And uh, it's, it's as natural as breathing when you are, um, when you're the, the one holding the societal power, right? You, you don't notice the things, the ways that you are um, oppressing, you only notice the ways you're oppressed. Um, and so uh, I think that white folks, we are ingrained with a sense of blindness um, from birth really. And so it took me a long time to notice that obviously, because as a white person, you know, being conditioned in this way, um, it, it doesn't, it's not made apparent until you kind of get smacked upside the head once or twice. And sometimes it takes maybe a dozen, <laughs> a dozen, and it's not just once or twice, but um, I was very lucky to get smacked upside the head pretty early. Um, and a couple of times, you know, a couple of times, but, um, and then the continuous, you know, once you notice, you kind of notice more things and you notice more things. And so by the time I was um, in college and graduating college, I had was I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. Um, I live here now but I spent a long time in Chicago for school. And, um, you know, growing up in a city like Louisville, which is very segregated, and then going to a city like Chicago, which is even more segregated, um, but then also having the benefit of uh, being in a college scenario where you're, you know, I took every, you know, black studies class I could find. I was gonna, I was gonna, his, your, your effect, your, the way that you carry yourself tells me you spent a whole lot of time around black people. Uh, you, you got you, you and you are right, tell me I'm wrong tell me I'm wrong you're not you're wrong. wrong no okay um, no. <laughs> <laughs> no um I, I yeah a lot of my closest friends have been black for most of my life so um you know I and they were you know unfortunately this is uh the burden that a lot of young black people end up having with their peers is they're the ones doing that smacking upside the head um and you know that that there's different reactions to that. You know, there can be um, denial or um, anger or, you know, all kind of the stages of grief because getting snapped out of white supremacy is kind of like a grieving process. And, um, and I think I went through a lot of them, right? You know, it wasn't just one or two. It, it was a lot of different things sometimes at the same time. Do but you remember um, Olivia A. Cole is here uh, and you can uh, follow her at Ranting Owl which I want to know what the hell that means, but we can get to that in a minute. <laughs> Do you remember the pivotal moment? Because, you know, um, a, a, we grow, different things force us into to growth, right? And that, that should be the goal, is yeah. to return to your celestial self, right? Through a series of experiences here on earth mm -hmm. and to be your higher being while you're here, right? Yeah. But that requires a lot of pain, a lot of growth. Lot of I can think of, and not just race, because that, that to me is like the small, the most base the most base form of like everything is to, to have that. Do you, but do you remember one experience where you were like, oh shoot, my whole life, my whole existence has been a lie. Man, you know, it's funny you ask um, because I, the, the, this book, The Truth About White Lies and then the book that comes out after this um, next year um, called Dear Medusa, the, both of them deal a lot in, you know, whiteness and race and gender and everything. And um I was, and I, so I thought about this a lot, you know, and both of these books, I had me thinking about one experience that I had in sixth grade, um, a good friend of mine from elementary school. So I'd gone to a mostly white uh, elementary school and then, um, you know, graduated into a mostly black middle school. 
And one of my good friends in elementary school, I was in ecology club with her. Her name's Michelle. She's out there. Hey, Michelle. We talked recently. Um, she's amazing. She's a singer. Um, she, Michelle Johnson. She's great. But, um, but we were good friends, you know, in elementary school, but in a mostly white environment, you know, I had different ideas about what that friendship was like than, than her being a young black girl in a mostly white environment. And so I was used to being the majority. Um, but then when we got to middle school and I was a, I was a loud mouth, you know, um, insecure, but loud mouth, like all the things that we like tell white girls to be right, like be outspoken, don't let anybody talk over you, like all the little feminist stuff that we, you know, we tell young white girls. And so I was that. And I get to sixth grade and uh, it is different now, right? You know, I'm at a mostly black school and Michelle is the majority now. And I hadn't realized that yet because even though I did grow up in a mostly white environment up until that point, um, you know, my mom raised us to not be racist. She raised, not to be anti-racist, but she raised us to not be racist. Um, she raised us to, you know, not see color, you know, that kind of stuff. And so I, you know, didn't, it's not that I didn't notice that most of my classmates were black at that point, but um, it didn't bother me. I was just like, oh, okay, this is different. But what I did notice <laughs> pretty quickly was the way the power dynamic shifted. Um, so here I am sitting in a mostly black classroom and Michelle sitting back there. And I had kind of noticed like, wow, she doesn't like hang out with me as much anymore. She's like hanging with, with the other black girls. And I, you know, was just like, okay. And one day we were in, <laughs> this is embarrassing. I wonder if she remembers this. Um, but we were in a uh, class and I was trying to hear because it was, I think it was science class and sat, my, sat, science and math aren't my, uh, my strong points. And so people were talking in the back. And I turn around and I was like, shut up. Oh, and Michelle, mm -hmm. <laughs> Michelle, you know, in elementary school, I can't, I can't remember how many times I might have told her to shut up, you know, because I told everybody to shut up. But Michelle wasn't having it that time. Michelle was like, you shut the fuck up. You know, you shut up. And I was just, I can't believe somebody's telling me to shut up. And but then it, but it hit me. I was like, something has changed. And I noticed that it was, it was racial, you know? And so I, I was like, how many times have I told her to shut up where she didn't feel okay telling me, no, you shut up, you know? Because she was in this all white environment where I felt powerful even without realizing it, you know? So that really stuck with me. And that was one of my first realizations. And then as time went on, I had a really hard time in middle school for various reasons, um, but I was dealing with some abuse. And so I was like, had a lot of anger issues. Um, you know, which is common when people are abused. But um, when I got to eighth grade, I was getting suspended a lot. I was getting, you know, detention, you know, stuff like that. But I noticed that even though I was doing all this stuff, you know, cousin out teachers, like all this stuff, I was still treated with these kid gloves almost. Like these teachers, these mostly white teachers, you know, they hated me, they hated me, but they weren't kicking me out of school. They weren't calling the police on me. And I started noticing that too, that my friends, black girls just got treated so much worse for doing the same or much less than, than I was. Um, and that I noticed that too, and I internalized that. Um, and I've, that was, you know, a lot of what I've tried to put into my work is those early realizations. I think that there's a lot of material out there for white folks to read about that's like nonfiction, um, you know, especially in 2020, right? They're like, all of a sudden, all these books, like white people, you need to read this. And this is how you like, you know, you know, no, not to knock Robin DiAngelo, but you know, like, um, you know, there are a lot of books like that. Um, but I don't always see, you um, like honest portrayals of how we got like this, you know, and the lies that we accept and the, the contract that we sign because, you know, we didn't ask for whiteness, right? We didn't ask for white privilege, but, um, but it happens. And then we're inducted into it and our parents make those decisions for us in the beginning, but eventually, and I talk about this in the book um, and also, in, you know, in essays and stuff that I've written recently, but just um, eventually we make those decisions. Um, eventually we are signing the racial contract as Charles W. Mills calls it. We're signing the racial, racial contract with our own hands, you know, with our own name. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a long process. And it, like you said, it's a lot of pain, but I think it's a necessary process. And one that um, I think white, you know, we're not helping young white people. You said in the beginning, like getting them young. And I, that's, that's exactly right. Um, I think that, not that it's ever too late, because I don't think it's ever too late. Uh, you know, I, I'm an optimist. But um, so maybe it's too late sometimes, but I, I, yeah. really don't, I don't like to think that, but especially, you know, I feel like the younger that you can, you can disrupt, 
that um, conditioning, you know, it starts very early, as I'm sure you know, you know, like, well, I mean, you know, you know how we know, because of all of this critical race theory, uh, eliminating books from schools, because the power structure knows that if you introduce empathy and humanity and truth and facts at a young age, you're going to raise up a generation of people that are going to question all of the nonsense and the BS and the lies and the misinformation and disinformation. And they don't want that to happen. But I asked this question, Olivia, and you can follow her at Ranting Owl, Ranting Owl, Ranting Owl. Uh, (laughs) She's the author of The Truth About White Lies. It's a YA book um, that takes, it takes a journey, a path of a young white girl uh, through this thing that we're talking about right now. Why would anyone want to trade in their privilege? Why would anyone give up? Why would you willingly do that, Olivia? What what benefit do you have between that? <laughs> you know, um, a student asked me this, uh, not this directly, but in, I, I teach a summer program here in Kentucky where I teach a lot of rural white youth and um, not just your rural white youth, but inevitably, you know, they're in my classroom. And um, again, never that directly, but they, they do, you know, come with that question. And uh, I think, you know, on the surface, the answer is like, well, why would you? Yeah, I, I agree. Why would you, right? Like you, you get this, you get this, you get this, you get all these benefits. Um, but the cost, um, the cost isn't free. Uh, and, you know, the, the fact is that like, none of us are free until all of us are free. And, you know, people put that on social media and, you know, like little quotables, but, um, but that's, that's true. Um, white supremacy is um, an illusion, um, obviously, but it's, it has very real consequences, right? Of course, but it's but it's an illusion. It's based on um, you know a void, and when you really dig deep, you see that white supremacy doesn't um, it, it benefits those it chooses to benefit until it chooses not to. Um, you you can become white. You can you can lose whiteness. Uh, it, it who that umbrella covers changes depending on what the political expediency is at the time. Um, you know, the Irish chose to become white. Um, lots of immigrant groups chose to become white. They gave up their cultures, they gave up their foods, they gave up their language, they gave up um, everything to, to cash in in this club, to be part of the club. And, you know, why would you give that up? Well, what do you, what do you gain when you give that up? You can gain a lot. You gain community, you gain truth, you gain justice. Um, white supremacy will eat us all alive. Uh, it, it, it eventually will come for everybody. Um, a good friend of mine, Lucy Brooks here in Kentucky, she writes about this. Um, she lost her brother to the opioid crisis, um, which, you know, there's a lot of discussion about the, what makes the opioid crisis a crisis and what made the crack epidemic an epidemic. But, um, and there's a lot of differences between the way these things are treated, obviously. But, you know, the facts are that the, this government doesn't give a damn about poor white people either. It cares about them more than poor black folks, but poor white folks are also being thrown in jail and, you know, thrown away and nobody cares about them either. This is all about benefiting the highest ruling class. And, um, you know, yeah, white folks may have a leg up on on black folks, but that's the wedge that that white supremacy has been driving between people um, since the beginning of this system uh, is how to divide, how to divide. You throw a bone to poor white people and think, well, that'll be enough. And, and, And for a long time, it has been. She's the author of The Truth About White Lies. Why? Because I think she's this generation's Jane Elliott. I think she is the one. And somebody was like, thanks, Karen, for clarifying. Because listening to Olivia Cole, I thought I was tripping. Yeah, you sound like a Black woman. I just want you (laughs) to know. Y'all, you know, and it's and it's tough to hang out with us and not walk away with the with the with the soul because that's what gets in you because that we all got it. That's the thing. Whiteness strips you of your soul. Like that's the thing that you lose. You lose your soul. All right. <laughs> I no, I agree. Sorry. It, it's right. a void. Welcome back. It is. It's a void. It, it strips cultural identity. It strips um, empathy. It strips meaning. Um, and you know, we can fill it with something else. Yeah, like Lauren Hill. She knew every word to that song. She wrote those words. All right. All right. So uh the book, the book, I saw you, the truth about white lies. And that's why we can hang. You know, I had a conference. There were a couple of white people at the conference, but it did, I didn't even notice because it was just people. Do you know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> Uh, you know, some people had less melanin than the others, but we all just, you know, a white lady playing spades that was kicking everybody's ass. I was like, you better do that. You better <laughs> go ahead. Uh, because that's that's how we roll. But mm. tell me, tell me about the truth about white lies and Shania, Shania uh, Hester. 
Yeah, thank you. I, I wanted to write something about um, a young woman who is kind of coming face to face with her whiteness, both um, along class lines. Um, she is more of a working from a working class background and she goes to this kind of like elite private school um, that is, you know, full of like legacy wealth and, you know, the, the wealthiest, whitest people in this uh, new town. It's a fictional town called Blue Rock. Um, and so I wanted to kind of show how you know, whiteness, like we were talking about earlier, you know, that umbrella can, you know, cover different people depending on what's expedient and, you know, what's, uh, you know, needed at that time. Um, but I also wanted to show like, uh, you know, like that, that class struggle that happens within, I mean, I definitely felt this um, when I was growing up, just knowing, well, there's, I know we are both white, but there's something different about her than me and that kind of access to we were talking about like dental care and things like that you know they're they're you know white people treat each other differently too there's layers to whiteness um and so i wanted to show that but then i also wanted to show how even though um shania is kind of struggling and you know feels herself you know she's got like a tooth it's what she calls like not quite right in her mouth and she's very aware of it um and teeth you know it's kind of our, our business card in this country right like teeth are such a big part of how you present um and so I wanted her to, to experience, to show that on the page, but then also uh, show how even though she has those struggles, she's still accepted into the fold, you know, without question. Um, she's put under the wing of the most popular white girl in school and um, the allowances that are made when you're white. And then also just some of the things that I feel like can't be done anywhere except for fiction, because I, you know, as we were saying earlier, there's nonfiction books and you know memoirs and things like that that are very helpful and I think are necessary. But there's something that you can do in fiction to kind of show what those processes look like within the in your head um, and how it feels in your body. Um, I think that white people were not accustomed to being honest about how how we the internalized superiority that we feel. Um, what we were talking about earlier with like Michelle Johnson, my old friend, um, that internalized superiority that I never was aware of. Um, but we we if once you become aware of it, you can't stop noticing it. And that's what I wanted to have for young white people to read. That's why it's a young adult book, um, was so that they can recognize those things in themselves and then get a hold on it. You know, get a hold on it because you you can change. It is possible, um, and you can you can stop doing these things. And I, but I wasn't just interested in writing a book that was like this is how you be a better white person because that's like what you were talking about. Like I don't want I don't want that. I want us to get rid of whiteness. Get rid of whiteness. And you know, there's people who are you know I want you to interrogate your whiteness so that you th can then get rid of it so that you can you know abolish it from your brain and then we can work on getting rid of it in this society. But you know, a lot of people hear that, um, same people banning these books, right? And it was like, banning whiteness, abolishing whiteness, that means genocide. That's, that's not what that means. Whiteness isn't white people, whiteness is a system. Um, it's an institution and we can get rid of it. The ignorance is exhausting. <laughs> it's so exhausting, I'm tired, tired of the ignorance. Olivia, so what does that look? I, I'm not optimistic because it has become, and I'm like, I'm fascinated that folk got in a room four or 500 years ago and was like, okay, we're going to sell black people because they can do, they can work and they got these spices and sugar and stuff. Oh, wait. Okay. So this is what we got to do. We're going to develop this system. All right. We're going to divvy up this continent because they don't even see the lines. You know, they don't, we're going to draw lines and borders and stuff. And then France, you take this, Bel Belgium, you take this, you, you turn over here, England, you got this. Okay. All right, go. And then we're going to use this new world as kind of the incubator of like all of the things and, and build the economy of all of these poor ass nations, uh, you know, that are struggling. OK, let's go. Mm. Oh, wait, we got to demonize because now the, the Irish are like getting in, in league with the Africans. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. The indentured. We got to separate them. Stop it. Stop mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And we and, and it's, it's still prevalent. We're watching it play out in Ukraine. We're watching it play out in Ukraine and Poland, where you know African students are being treated horribly, trying to leave. And There's, the you world can have as many Ukrainian refugees as you want. Like I think, what is it? Britain saying that like we can have. Well, there's no cap. Bring as many Ukrainian refugees as as, as we can take. And it's like, oh, what's different here? I wonder. Yeah, yeah. But we're watching this. So okay, are, are, are you say you're relatively optimistic? And I love I love novels because, again, people get to see themselves in characters. That's how we 
we imagine. The next book, The Truth About White Lies, is a continuation of Shania Hester's story, or is it a so, completely different? The, the Truth About White Lies is a standalone novel, and it um, takes place in Blue Rock a, about a character named Shania. And then my book next year, Dear Medusa, is not a sequel. Um, it's in no way related to this one, but in my head, they're in the same universe. Um, it's kind of, they're both young white girls uh, who are struggling with their with their gender well Shania is not struggling with her gender um but she, the character in next year's book is dealing with some different things but I always to me you can't write um a a, a book about a white character without talking about race I mean this, this is all race is everywhere it's it's made up but it but it's everywhere and I, I have a real problem with um with books by white authors who um, race is invisible, um, unless, of course, it's a black character that suddenly appears on the page, and then race, you know, it only exists when that black character is in the room. But mm. even if you have a book full of only white characters, race is still happening. There's, there's race, you know, that we have to explain why there are no black people in the room. Why are there only white people in this room in this novel? Um, race is happening. Uh, so, so yeah, race is in mm. it, whiteness. I'm always interrogating whiteness in all of all of my work. Yeah. You made me re-examine a book that I read a couple of years ago that I absolutely loved. Um, and I initially thought the main character was black because I see myself in everything and you're not going to ever leave me out. Where the crawdads live. Um, uh, that book was so amazing. And I thought the main character was black. Mm -hmm. She wasn't. But, mm -hmm. you know, for half the book, I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> she's not, I think she's not black. Is here. <laughs> 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 something very white about this um okay <laughs> ranting owl what what is a ranting owl oh man it's 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 nothing honestly like my my dad always called me um you know like a, a an angry owl growing up he's like oh you're such an angry little owl um I don't know if it like I liked owls I guess I, but that it just kind of like stuck and then when I was time to I was like blogging in college and I was always mad about something. So I was just ranting out and then I picked my Twitter and then it was too late to change it because <laughs> a lot of people stuck with some horrible yeah. Twitter handles. <laughs> I got Karen Hunter. I got the whole name and then, yeah. then, the, yeah. then, mm -hmm. then Karen turned into a thing, but I'm Karen Hunter. So it's working You're out for Karen. me. Yeah, it's yeah. Work, it's, no, but also Karen Hunter. See? Oh, so Karen Hunter. Ah, See, so it can all, I'm going to spin it any kind of way. Y'all yeah, not going to destroy my name. Here. Go yeah. ahead, kick, kick rock. All right, so um, <laughs> as as we're walking through this, um, have you gotten a lot of backlash? I'm, I'm curious because, you know, uh, wondering about the hate mail that you might receive or you're a sellout or a traitor to your race. Um, uh, are you getting any of that, Olivia Cole? Oh, yeah, 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 always. Um, what does that look like and where does it show up? Uh, it, I don't see it as much on Twitter, uh, but I don't think I, I, Twitter's filters have gotten a little better as far as like filtering out hate speech and stuff. Uh, so I haven't seen it as much on Twitter lately, but I always get a lot of stuff to my, um, my Instagram and my email, my email. I'm, I'm, I'm considering closing down my contact form on my website, but I get some great emails from there too. Like I've had white folks, you know, contacting me this week with some really like moving and like important information that, you know, um, they don't necessarily need a response, but I'm glad that they're doing it. And I want to be able to like receive that. Um, but I still, yeah, hate mail. I mean, I've been getting hate mail forever. So it's anything shocking, like the most shocking thing you've received since you wrote this, this book. I'll say, uh, anything that not much really shocks me anymore, unfortunately, but the, the main thing, um, I'm a mother, I have a four-year-old and, uh, th when they bring up my kid, that's, that's always a little, uh, that makes me real upset. Uh, I, I am like, say what you want about me, but you bring my baby into it. And that's, it's just, but that's the thing when it, with white supremacy, there are no children, you know, uh, uh especially, you know, children of color. Um, but you know, white supremacy doesn't care about children because white supremacy only cares about power and children are powerless. Um, and so that, that's always like that, you know, that that whole institution like there's nothing that is too precious um you know so so that 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 really hurts me but uh and when i get those messages you know i i try to do a quick scan to see you know if there's any because you know it, it is quite upsetting when it's about my baby but um so those i'll just you know send straight to the trash and try not to read all of them but but others you know i still read it you know because i i even though some of them are like you know, pretty intense. Uh, I do like to not like <laughs> it's not enjoyable, but but to to read just to see where they're coming from because um, sometimes I learn something, um, even if it's okay. I got to think about that too and how to how to talk to people about that, how to get that out of my students' heads, how to combat that. Um, 
because I think it is important to know at least where where the thoughts are coming from, even if they are disgusting to me. Uh, when when you come back, I want to talk strategy uh, about how we do dismantle this thing called whiteness uh, and start with the babies. But you're you're, you're you've given a, a nice little blueprint and and the books, the novels, what what you are, what you read as much as you are what you eat um and the truth about white lies i think that should be like given out passed out like like how they pass out condoms that's how i feel about it i agree uh <laughs> thank you um yeah it's one of those things it's like i i wrote it for white people but um you know there's a tradition in this country and you know, our literary literary tradition of you know black folks and brown folks doing all the writing about um, white supremacy and what to do about it and you know i'm trying to do my part but then white people have to read it and all my friends who are authors are like, Olivia, nobody, nobody's going to buy this book. <laughs> These, <laughs> they're like, well, your people don't want to hear, they're not going to read about themselves. And I was like, shit, I didn't think about that. How is it selling? How is it selling? I have no idea, Karen. I'm, like, I'm afraid to ask. <laughs> All right. Everybody that has a white uh, person in their lives, buy this book and then give it to them as a gift. When you go to the to their uh pic their picnics because they have picnics, um, <laughs> we go to their picnics. You know, make sure I'm giving this to your child. You know, they if you know somebody, your boss's child. You know, you know what I'm saying. We got to sneak it in like how we put the vegetables now in the spaghetti sauce. <laughs> this is what we got to do. I feel yeah. like there's got to be a movement. <laughs>